Hello and welcome to this Freedom Festival lecture, uh, which is being organised in partnership with the Friends of Sierra Leone National Railway Museum, uh, Hull Culture and Leisure, um, the Freetown Society here in Hull and the University. Especially welcome to members of the Hull Afro-Caribbean Association who have been a central partner um, in the project that we're going to be talking about today. And to our friends at Hull Museums, particularly Sarah Howard and Robin uh, Diper, who have been um, essential in our uh, joint work in uh, co-creating an exhibition based around some photography. The central focus of that exhibition, the photography, is what we'll be talking about today. And so really what I want to share with you are some of the aspects of this photography, why we went about this project, and also uh, what the images suggest to us. But throughout, if you're listening to this online, uh, then please get in touch if you've got any suggestions as to what we've missed, what we've got wrong, or other areas in which we could tease further this story about uh, wartime photography and journeying through Sierra Leone during the 1940s. I'm Dr Nick Evans, I'm a senior lecturer in diaspora history at the University of Hull's Wilberforce Institute, um, and it's really a delight for me to be able to uh, speak to you today, wherever you may be. Thank you. So on the third Slavery Remembrance Day held here in Hull in uh, uh, 21, I was approached by a leading member of the Hull Freetown Society, uh, Trish Dolby, who is now the Deputy Lieutenant of the Lord County of uh, East Riding of Yorkshire and the former Deputy Chief Executive of Hull City Council. And through her work as a leading figure in the council, a leading figure in the county, but also as an active promoter of Freetown, uh, Trish had been approached a, a, a short time earlier by members of the family of Corporal Fred Burden about some images that their grandfather, as it was, had taken during the Second World War. At the time, they were in the uh, custodianship of Fred's granddaughter, Emma. Uh, at the minute, they're in the hands of his daughter or her mother, um, Judith. But throughout the Burden family, Fred's family, um, have been helpful in helping us to access and to explore uh, the photographs that Fred took. As you'll quickly work out, Fred was an active and avid photographer during the Second World War, where he was stationed as um, part of the British Armed Forces. And during his time in, uh, the, in Sierra Leone, he took lots of photographs. So when we were loaned this collection of photographs, they immediately sprung to mind that they were, would be fantastic for an exhibition, but it wasn't going to be something particularly in, um, in the aftermath of the Black Lives Matter debates of 2020, that we as a group of uh, predominantly white academics at the Wilberforce Institute wanted to profile and showcase ourselves. So instead, we decided to work with people of African birth or African descent um, particularly Sierra Leonean birth and or Sierra Leonean descent, um, to help them to under, uh, help us to understand what these images show and how to reinterpret them for modern audiences here in the UK, especially in the Humber area, um, in 2022. The project took a life of its own, really, um, and we could never have imagined um, it would eventually uh, be now going to tour Sierra Leone at the end of this year, 2023, and beginning of 2024. And so really it just goes to show the power of photography and the power of these images taken by a young person stationed during the horrors of the Second World War um, to actually um, strengthen ties between Sierra Leone and the UK today. Throughout the images of this event, it's being organised uh, with friends of the Sierra Leone National Railway Museum, uh, uh, the Hull's Freetown Society, Hull Museums and Hull, the Hull Freedom Festival. But throughout, the support of my colleagues at the University of Hull has been really essential. And I'd particularly like to thank um, Claire um, and Judith, uh, who've been really instrumental in helping me um, to display, portray and edit this film. And so thank you very much. So having discovered that there was this fantastic reservoir of images, a photographic collection of some five, 600 images, mainly in a bound volume, but also some additional loose uh, images. And we began a period of consultation in 2022 um, with uh, the whole Afro-Caribbean Association. 
One of its leading lights, Sidi Maju, who was born in Sierra Leone but now lives in Hull, uh, was really brought to life with the photo photographs of his homeland. And this gave us the title Homelands, which is now evident in the exhibition we'll mention a bit later. He loved the fact that it really distilled the essence of his homeland he was very much in love with still and proud of, in that it was a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-faith society, in which um, there was a lot more to understand than its capital city, Freetown, that we often here in the UK hear so much about. Freetown is twinned with Hull um, and has been so since 1979. And yet here in the UK, especially here in Hull, we don't really know much about Freetown beyond the fact that a Hull-born man, William Wilberforce, uh, played an important part in trying to end slave trading there, or that the area had gone through later a civil war in the 1980s, 1990s, and through to the noughties. And second, thirdly, that it had been affected by Ebola. And so three negative stories. And so what we wanted to do in presenting some of these photographs and teasing some of these stories out was to really uh, showcase positive aspects of Sierra Leonean history concerning Freetown, but especially its hinterland. And so quickly, through regular meetings of the consultation group, we, uh, including uh, Sida Maju um, and other members of the whole Afro-Caribbean Association, we distilled some of these, this large collection of images to some powerful 50 images, which are now displayed in the Homelands exhibition. We were armed with both images or labels on the images that were in the first album from, by Fred or by his wife, I'll discuss that later, but also the group's knowledge, which included uh, medical knowledge from Dr. Uh, Dominic Cherwa, uh, uh, Sierra Leonean cultural knowledge by Sidi Maju, and also uh, for photographic and artistic knowledge by uh, Glynis Neslin. And together, those three members of the Hull Afro Caribbean Association really made a corpus of a fantastic team who helped us interpret both Sierra Leonean and broader West African culture apparent in these photographs. The images were important too because they were they were captured on a thing called a block box brownie, a quite a small set photo a camera popularized in the UK at least in the 1940s. And the images are quite small, you know, literally some kind of like um, 10 by 10 centimeters or something. So quite small. Um, and so what we wanted to do was really have a look at these images and, and ensure that they could uh, tell different aspects, different stories that we could put, uh, gather for what was called a, a co-produced exhibition, which, which was opened in uh, Black History Month 2022. Throughout, we wanted to reveal heritage, heritage of Sierra Leone, heritage of the UK, shared heritage. But crucially, we wanted to dispel negative perceptions of Sierra Leone as a country uh, defined by negative moments in its past. So despite the lengthy Sierra Leone and history of Sierra Leone, we largely in the UK hear about anti-slavery, so the negativity of human trafficking, about the civil war, in other words, the divisive nature of society and politics, or about the disease pandemic, particularly Ebola. And so we wanted to think, well, these are just snapshots in the country's history. What do we know more? What, what stories can we tell people in Hull? What can we tell, what stories could instill pride in Hull about its partner that were positive and that would really be something we could tell children and, and elderly people alike and really inculcate or strengthen that relationship between both twin cities. Hull was twinned with Sierra Leone, Freetown Sierra Leone in 1979, the first city in the world to choose an African city to be partner with. Most would choose those in America or in uh, Western Europe. And so it was a really proud part of our history, something we at the Wilberforce Institute at the University of Hull are very proud of too. And so this was very much about something that we wanted to do together as a team, as a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multinational group to try and reinterpret this story because the photographs themselves as a piece of creative work, a body of creative work, were so powerful that we thought the story couldn't go untold. So who was Corporal Fred Burden? When war broke out in 1939, Fred was just entering the end of his teens. So he was a young man in his prime, 
rather than staying here to defend the country or to go to overseas to fight in either Europe or in the Navy, Fred opted for part of the uh, armed forces which was stationed in West Africa as part of an, uh, uh, the, uh, a fleet of uh, armed uh, 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 service. And what it sought to do was to uh, make the use of, of skilled work, skilled knowledge by engineers like Fred to help maintain um, um, planes that would help defend uh, vessels, merchant vessels bound for the UK with important goods, uh, foodstuffs and other things that kept and maintained Britain's war effort during the long uh, global war. Fred, of course, was British and he was white. And in an era defined by racism and, and imperial uh, thinking, he quickly made a, a, was promoted from a junior ranking to that of corporal, purely because of his race, but uh, augmented because of his skill. And so, uh, but despite this uh, privileged position, Fred, through the images, through talking to his family and through the reading the letters, never abused his position, was never furthered these racial ideas and tried throughout his photography and other means to reduce racism, reduce prejudice, and show that he was part of a much more global world, an equal world. We know that his, his work as a fitter armourer on bombs and guns um, helped Britain's war effort. And so really this is part of a broader story of uh, expanding the narrative of Britain's war effort uh, from the D-Day and other uh, bombing of Britain and other key moments to exploring the global nature of warfare. But crucially, rather than just recovering a white story or conversely, a black story of Sierra Leone's, Sierra Leoneans, it seeks to do, our work seeks to do two things through Fred's photography, to show the multiracial and multi-ethnic response to the war and how Britons of all identities, of all religions, wherever they lived in the world, came together to help the war effort. As shown in this image, there are very few uh, actual images of Fred, and so this was quite a rare one, shown here with bananas. And this was um, after he'd gone through a period of illness, and which I'll discuss later, which had affected, um, affected his health significantly for, and did so for the rest of his life. But Fred was very much a family man who was geared towards helping others. And in this image on the right, we get a brief snapshot into post-war life when he'd returned to normal and been demopped and was very much into his nuclear family of him, him, his wife, his daughter and son. And so what we get is Fred, a man, a family man who very much believed in equality. He did so in numerous ways, not just through this photography that we'll talk about today. He also, for example, after the war, built a motorbike, but rather than he driving it, encouraged his wife to learn to drive the motorbike too, at a time when motorbike driving was largely gendered. And so therefore he, he believed very much in gender equality. But he also believed in educational equality too. And having um, uh, quickly retired early, he decided to use his skill as a, as a teacher to help people with uh, uh, to progressing non-education, uh, non-traditional ways through education, through practical experiences and other ways too. So this person who had benefited through his privileged position quickly turned to help others. And this was a story evident in his photography and throughout the West of his life. And really the one thing I'd love to have done was to have met Fred, but I've had the joy of meeting his daughter and granddaughter too. So it's very much we get a glimmer of that great man through both the stories and crucially here, the photography. So during the Second World War, uh, Fred was ba based largely in Sierra Leone on the west coast of Africa. Sierra Leone at the time was a British colony. Uh, its headquarters was Freetown, a harbour, one of the largest uh, uh, safe anchorages in the British world, indeed the Atlantic world. And it was through here that Fred arrived in 1943. The railway was relatively limited it bisected from west to east and then further off through a branch line further north to the mineral districts of the north of Sierra Leone. But for passengers, it largely concerned travelling along the south between Freetown and Pendambu. Um, and and in, in, um, in Fred's case, he stopped quickly when he arrived um, at Bow. 
But as the, as the crude map on the right demonstrates, uh, taken from the 1950s, Sierra Leone wasn't just a homogenous country. I won't go into the detail of the country's history here, but all I'll briefly suffice to say is that it was formed for diverse reasons, particularly anti-slavery endeavours, but also other, um, other uh, reasons as well, of different peoples and different identities, particularly the Mendi and the Temni are very well known, but those across, the, um, across Sierra Leone are very much make up the country. So the further along the railway Fred went, the further he would be exposed to other cultural traditions, especially those of the Mende, Creole and Sherbro areas. And really for Fred, this was clearly something that brought his, him to life, that he saw a very homogenous, very much a non-white world. And according to his daughter, one of the reasons he didn't really capture Freetown as much was that he would be less interested in cities and more getting out into the rural areas and exploring the country. Uh, a strategy he developed or deployed here in the UK in encouraging him and his family to get out and explore the rural areas. And thus we know through Fred's uh, experiences and evidence in his photography that he very much wanted to capture throughout his lifelong passion with photography, different vignettes, different snapshots into Sierra Leone culture, history and identity. And it's some of those themes that we'll explore now. So one of the key ways of, of navigating Sierra Leone at that time, in other words, under British rule until 19, the 1960s, was largely uh, started off by train. And as many travellers who navigated Sierra Leone for, uh, for business, for pleasure or for wartime activity would have experienced, it involved a rather protracted journey along a, a, a railway uh, network developed by Britain during its rule after 1808. The railway advanced, particularly in the late uh, um, or the Edwardian period, and so by the by the outbreak of the Second World War, it was pretty much well developed. As shown on the left, it involved often staged journeys or, or stopping off, uh, stopping off at different routes along the way, and so rather like travellers sticking out their head, Fred stuck out his lens and captured some of the sights and sounds as he arrived in each station in this case shown here in his label, Songo. Along the way too, the stops were sometimes protected and at Brid the bridge in Allentown, he certainly must have stopped off long enough to climb down uh, from the viaduct to actually photograph it and re reflect on the other British engineering imported to the country to further the expansion of the railway. He may also have been looking, shown in this image, um, at the actual locomotives Many of them built in uh, Leeds and others further south in England, but most all of them were imported, both the locomotives and the railway stock. And so therefore we see this, this development and this introduction of Britishness, British engineering, and captured in the photographs by this engine fitter. Of course, the journey was protracted and at the railway rest, as he describes it, we see how because he was white, he stayed in the decent uh, railway rest facility at Bo, the second city of Sierra Leone, which was much more comfortable than the non-white combatants and other indigenous Sierra Leoneans who would have made that railway journey too. But through this railway rest at Bo, he became uh, explored further into the interior of Sierra Leone and captured further stories too. Many of them shown in the image in the bottom right reflected Christian traditions, or therefore Easter dancing. Others were that were more traditional and it displayed both uh, Islamic and other Christian uh, uh, religious practices, as well as other non-Western uh, and non-organized religions too. And so therefore we see the, the, um, the journey was very much multicultural um, and a learning experience for him. If you look carefully though, on the uh, in the right hand side of this image in the bottom right, we also see a non-white sailor. And so therefore we know throughout that rather than being a group of white uh, imperial troops, they were very much a multi-ethnic uh, uh, complement of crew who he traveled with and who uh, served with him. And Fred's images were very carefully uh, choreographed to ensure they reflected the rich diversity of the people he encountered rather than privileging white soldiers, white combatants, white engineers. Of course, 
because he was in the armed services, because he was white, he would have traveled in first class at the time. First class then wasn't quite what we'd imagine first class travel in England to be. However, it's certainly less crowded and certainly more comfortable for the soldiers and engineers navigating Sierra Leone. In what I seem to remember is a, is a Hunslet made locomotive shown in the bottom left. We had uh, uh, pulling this long train journey to boat. He would have, from his first class travels, seen many different vistas, including children gathering at railway stations. Also in the top right, uh, children going to the school on board the train uh, all the way to Bow. But one of the rarest images we have, uh, according to one of the experts in the Sierra, Friends of Sierra Leone National Railway, Tim, is the image in the bottom right. And why this is so rare is that many images capture locomotives, the exterior of carriages or people at st seen at stations. But few, indeed, we think this is the only one, capture uh, uh, the interior of the first class area with uh, military personnel inside it. You may be thinking, mm, that doesn't look very comfortable. Well, you're probably right. Um, and the reason for that it doesn't look as comfortable is that alongside uh, Fred and his fellow um, um, officers, are uh, equipment and facilities that were being transported along with them on the railway to the interior to newly equipped British offices which were being built in the interior through the energies and the auspices of Fred and his counterparts. So therefore we see how the railways journeys were uh, important ways in which the war effort was maintained, both the movement of people, goods as well as ideas. Crucially, though, there are lots of things that he, we, he may have heard at the time, which his photographs don't show. And so when we were visit, when the exhibition which we produced with the photographs called Homelands opened in October 2022, we were really privileged that uh, the Deputy Minister of Culture and Tourism, uh, Mr. Robinson from the Sierra Leone government, came over to see the exhibition. <clears throat> During his visit, supported, as we can see in this image, uh, Mr. Robinson on the left, Helen Ashby from Sierra Leone National Railway, some of the curators from the museum who visited too, as well as our own Sidi Maju shown on the right. We, they began to sing a song that many of the school children would have sung on the train journey to Bow. So you can see for a second just one of the songs which British audiences will recognise the tune of, in which kids would have sung uh, the songs going uh, about uh, refuelling the steam trains going over to Bow on that journey. So you can only begin for a second to imagine some of the sights and sounds that Fred would have heard as long as those that he photographed or that he saw. Travelling by railway, though, was only one part of the journey, and rather like uh, the famous film uh, tr planes, trains and automobiles. At the time, and travel around uh, Sierra Leone was a lot more uh, protracted and, and involved a series of different uh, uh, methods of movement too. There were civilian ones shown in the top left across uh, inland navigations. There was the use of uh, military launches, such as Jouet in the bottom left, as well as the good old traditional ways of of using local knowledge to navigate rivers as well, shown in the middle. On the right, we see one of the inland uh, navigation stations near Waterloo. And so we see very much how there are a series of different craft, different mechanisms and different ways in which Fred navigated Sierra Leone. Unusually, only the bottom left shows the military way of traveling. The rest reveal popular ways in which visitors and residents alike would have traversed Sierra Leone at the time. But at its heart for Fred were the people, and the people uh, were central, and the positive and strong way in which he choreographed his photography clearly demonstrates to us 
that all of these images were carefully prepared and assembled and demonstrated his keen photographic eye. Without doubt, the smile and the countenance of the image in the, in the left of Betsy Miserley at Bow demonstrates the warmth of his relationship. And we believe she ran the railway rest at Bow that he stayed at. Indeed, a letter, very rare letter has survived between Betty and her daughter who lived in Freetown, asking if she would look after Fred when he arrived in Freetown, extolling his virtues as someone a believer of God who uh, believes in all of us as being equal and not divided by race. And thus we know that uh, very much Fred was a much loved temporary dweller in Sierra Leone and certainly was so important that Betty recommended her daughter looks after him when she he arrived back in Freetown. Other images show children and political elites who Fred encountered. Clearly he thought they had a, a countenance or a physical difference worthy of documenting. So we have an image of the uh, Paramount Chief in what the group believed are um, British civil, civilian uh, uniforms, uh, shown in the, in the image on the second left, as well as a child uh, wearing a traditional uh, type of headgear in the middle. And then also the Paramount Chief and his supporters in the right. One of the challenges for us is that the Paramount Chief in Bow looks very different in the images. So it's quite hard to work out who was who and how accurate some of Fred's labels were. So if you have any other ideas on the names, please get in touch. But crucially, the school children that Fred had encountered on their journey to school in Bow were also shown in the school dormitory in the top right. And this is part of the Church Missionary Society school in Bow, uh, run by missionaries, but which uh, enabled both Muslim and Christian faiths to be educated equally. Um, and you see here the school uniform and the uniformality of um, their appearance too. Crucially, according to uh, knowledge from Sidi Maju, the children of paramount chiefs and other elites, uh, indigenous elites in Sierra Leone, sent their children to such schools in order to get the best of educations possible. And therefore, the children of the elites were given an advantage through this education to help maintain their strength and important position in Sierra Leone society. Given this was the 1940s as well, it's an important part in helping the country to be prepared and equipped ready for self-governance in the 1960s. Also important too was the heritage, much of it intangible heritage, but of the, some of it built heritage too, both of indigenous cultures and British identity as well. On the top left at Zhui, the RAF base, we see uh, stilted performers who performed to the British troops and engineers stationed at RAF Shiri. Um, in 1943. According to Sidi, they performed in clothing of Islamic tradition in a dance that he's very much seen and can even perform. And so we see very much how there was an interchange of performances and ideas too. Crucially, British ideas of culture were not were displayed alongside those of indigenous traditions as well. And therefore, we see that Fred was as fascinated by other cultures as he was Britishness being replic replicated far removed from home. At Hastings, bottom left, he would have seen a church missionary uh, uh, a building as well. And so we'd have seen very much the Anglican tradition being imposed on Sierra Leone. But elsewhere, some of the negative aspects of Britishness were also captured by Fred. In the middle left, in the uh, top middle image, we see cannon on an island called Bunce or Bans Island which was run by the Scots as a slave trading fort in the middle of the Sierra Leone uh, uh, um, River in the 18th century. And so Fred clearly had a military eye to capture these historic military weapons that had been left in the aftermath of that uh, horrible moment in British history. So too, Fred photographed the graves of earlier military combatants from Britain who died and were buried at Pans Island. But on the right, we found an image which the group would take, took some time to interpret and indeed were corrected by a heritage professional, Azatu Smith uh, from uh, Sierra Leone. Fred had recorded this as a female watch do uh, what, witch doctor. I've never heard of that. And so uh, we, we discussed this as a group and we worked out that 
actually the facial features of the mask were much smaller and intricate and therefore must have reflected the female nature. It was a secret society called the Sande Society, which Fred would have never known. And at the time we thought, oh, this must be a female society, and then very good to show how uh, cultural traditions of women as well as men had been documented by Fred. But in preparing the exhibition, what we didn't realise was the Sande Society were involved in a practice of female genital mutilation. And therefore, the image of uh, the person was masked to uh, hide their identity uh, as part of a ritual of indigenous cultural practice, which many of us see as abhorrent today. And therefore, it revealed an important aspect that Fred would not have known all, the, all what he was photographing and clearly visually recognised there was difference, but that actually he couldn't understand all of the uh, uh, idiosyncrasies. And indeed, it was as Dartu Smith and her uh, decades of cultural practice for the Sierra Leone government that enabled us fully to interpret this story too. Some of the more unusual images actually uh, included the war worker Fred, never revealing the military secrets, but instead the human aspect of his comradeship in Sierra Leone. The image of the one on the left shows to me really very much Fred's uh, strong, strong relationship with um, British soldiers um, who were non-white. And therefore we see in this image uh, an indigenous soldier who clearly wanted to show what his traditional military uniform would have looked like. In the middle, we have a group of, of, of engineers and fitters, but again, they have combatants who were both white and non-white. So what was very unusual with Fred's photography is it didn't reveal a racial hierarchy, racial segregation, but instead the universality of the British war effort in Sierra Leone. The bottom right shows a rare image of, of just white people. Indeed, Fred's images seldom show only white people and very rarely showed himself. Indeed, it was a, a struggle with the help of his family. We resolved this to find an image of Fred. And in the top right, we see where some of that furniture on the train was bound for. A temporary military uh, uh, building equipped using indigenous uh, knowledge and engineering skill by the British to jointly erect uh, 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 accommodation for military activities further in the interior of Sierra Leone. So what do we take from these images? What can we find? What do we deduce from it? Well, as this is shown in briefly in some of the highlights here, Fred's journeys began on railway in Freetown, travelled through the heart of uh, Freetown, including Moyambe and Allentown and eventually culminated at the major railway junction of Bow, the second city of Sierra Leone. It may have been then that Fred contracted malaria, which majorly plagued the rest of his life and indeed blighted and probably ended prematurely his stay in Freetown. We don't quite know all the details, but we do know that when he returned, he got married, but then had to go through a period of convalescence afterwards. But it didn't blight his love for Sierra Leone nor his passion for the people of Sierra Leone. But what we do know is that Freetown occupied less attention than many visitors today when they visit Sierra Leone and people at the time. He literally, as his daughter would uh, narrate, got out and about and explored the proper country to reveal through his photography the full story of Sierra Leone. And I hope really through these images, you get a good insight into that journey. As a historian, though, we always have to be aware of the problematic nature of such sources. How Im images are being presented to us may not reveal everything. And ultimately, um, what's important when we look at these images is what's not documented and what's not revealed through it. Here today for this event, we were gathered because of the Freedom Festival in Hull or the, uh, the Freetown uh, work of the, uh, here in Hull or the partnership with the Sierra Leone National Railway. But what else did Fred photograph that haven't been survived, hasn't survived? Were there any images that were censored and removed from other places that he went to, such as in the Gambia, in Ghana, Cape Town, and Gibraltar? Fewer images survive of those places, and that reveals either he was suffering from the longer effects of illness, he'd run out of film, or that his, his photography was increasingly being limited. 
Through talking with Fred's family, particularly his daughter Judith, we learned that the war had a longer term effect on his health. And so we suggest that the album may have been prepared by his wife as part of his convalescence to buoy him up when he went through a period of post-traumatic stress. But was it also the photographs were assembled by his wife and therefore reveal female agency, female ways of reading these images? And how does that interpret how we view his images five or six decades later? Crucially, what effect did mental health have on his photography? Did it blight his willingness to take pictures? Did it make him insular? Was the letter to, from Bo to Freetown to look after Fred because he was suffering from the physical and psychological effects of warfare? Did other people take photographs as well and how did they differ? But what's certain for all of these images is they reveal a normal individual, a rank and file individual, stationed overseas during the Second World War. The photography was very different from those of many people, such as those archived in the Imperial War Museum and other military museums that mainly show studio portraits or photographs of ad admirals or military uh, leaders. Instead, Fred's view was of someone of lesser status, but an important status enough to be able to reveal to us lots of insights that he travelled. So to conclude, I hope we hope that this project and these photographs today have been of interest. Hopefully they will have given people in the UK a new view of Sierra Leone to those that we often hear of in the news or through museum exhibitions and through history books. The reinterpreting and preserving of these images is work in progress. So we would like to hear further if you know of other image collections or can help reinterpret the images or correct things that we've seen today. The Homelands exhibition has a number of videos online, so please search YouTube if you'd like to know more. Or if you'd like to visit and are able to, then please come and see the Homelands exhibition being showcased here at the Wilberforce Institute in the heart of Hull Museums during the Freedom Festival 2023. We're in the museum's quarter here in Hull City Centre and you're welcome to come. Please check our website for further information. If you're from further afield and in Sierra Leone, that country Fred loves so much, then uh, we're, through the help of the Sierra Leone Railway Museum, we're able to showcase this exhibition from November this year. And so we would uh, welcome you at the Sierra Leone National Railway Museum, other sites to be announced in Freetown, and also others in Bow that we'll announce in 2024. But please get in touch if you've got any questions. And ultimately, uh, uh, please enjoy the photographs of Fred wherever you see them. Crucially, just imagine for a second, as I often do, how much Fred would have enjoyed having his photographs celebrated in this way and shared with people he loved so much, the people of Sierra Leone. Thank you for listening. Here are our contact details if you'd like to know more. If not, just Google me, Nick Evans, or the Wilberforce Institute to learn more about our work. For our partners at Hull Museums, please explore their collections online through Hull Museums, just Google Hull Museums collections. And if not, just enjoy research in Sierra Leone history, a rich history that reveals more attention wherever you are in the world. Thank you for listening.